Hello, hello everyone. My name is Perry Pyle. I'm an archivist here at the Historical Society in Tucson. And welcome to Is My House Historic or Just Old? How to Conduct Property Research in the Tucson Area. Just uh, as a quick reminder to everyone, this uh, is being recorded tonight and we will um, be sending out a link to the recording afterwards to all the participants, just so if you miss anything, like I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of information shared tonight. So uh, just in case you miss anything, you'll have an, keep an eye out for an email follow-up um, in the next couple of days. All right, so we have a very exciting group of people here tonight. Uh, and I'm just gonna get started by giving, giving our little spiel from the Historical Society. Okay, so the Arizona Historical Society was established by an act of the first territorial legislature, November 7th, 1864, which makes us the old, Arizona's oldest historical agency. And we have four locations throughout the state, four main locations, Flagstaff, uh, the Pioneer Museum in Flagstaff, Sanguinetti House in Yuma, the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe, and the Arizona History Museum here in Tucson, which is where I work and obviously our focus of tonight on Tucson. Uh, so the mission of the Historical Society is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. And one of the ways that we've been doing that, especially with the pandemic has uh, been by presenting virtual programs. And we're trying to make an effort to bring people closer to the kinds of questions like property research that we get all the time here in the archives. Uh, quick plug for our new license plate that you can order through azmbdnow.gov. Uh, we have this cool monsoon license plate and a percentage of the proceeds goes directly to us to support uh, all sorts of both our in-person uh, museums that are open and also these sorts of programs that we're doing right now. And since I mentioned places being open, two of our locations are currently open. The Heritage Center in Tempe and the History, the History Museum here in Tucson. We're currently open Tuesday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2, and you can buy your tickets online in advance if you'd like or just walk in. Um, we've got a couple of new really exciting exhibits that have just started or are about to start. In Tempe, we have the Unframed, a photo journey through Navajo and Hopi nations, uh, which is a really amazing photography exhibit that we just had uh, installed just went up last week, featuring the work of Catherine McKenna. And then in Tucson, we're all very pumped and excited because we've got a space exhibit coming called Ready to Launch. We just, uh, last week, we got a giant 600 pound delivery from NASA of a, uh, a very exciting item that we'll be installing soon. That opens on May 20th. Uh, like I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of these virtual programs, about one a week. Uh, so this is our first one in May, and then followed up in a couple of days we're doing on Saturday, we're having Somos Bilingües, uh, about bilingual education in Arizona. Then we are doing one called The Senator Was a Ham, I love that title, about Barry Goldwater's ham radio that is also featured here at the uh, at the History Museum in Tucson right now. We have his ham radio. Uh, and then later on in the month, we have Cobra Sagrado, um, which will be another great event that we got. So you can sign up by going to our website, azhs.org slash calendar and register just like you did for this one. Uh, another quick plug for membership. Uh, members are the backbone of the society. They really help us to put on events like this. Uh, and you get a couple of perks. You get free admission to the museums, a 10% discount in the museum shops, and a subscription to the Journal of Arizona History, uh, which comes out quarterly. So lots of perks, lots of great things, and we love your support. Uh, and the journal is also available on Project Muse uh, to be viewed. All right, so lastly, you can visit our website for more information. Uh, and I just want to, right before we start this panel, just give a quick uh, PSA about, um, so tonight we are not going to be answering any specific questions or we just don't have the time to answer any specific questions about properties. 
but you can always follow up in that email we're going to send out. We'll have our the archives email here. It's ahsreference at azhs.gov. You can always follow up with us and we'll help you do your research. We get questions every week and we'll be able to, to, to help navigate all of these resources. Um, and then lastly, if everyone could just keep, except for my, uh, my presenters, if you could just keep your cameras off uh, and your microphones muted for the duration of the event until we get later on. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat put, uh, and we will be going through some the Q&A at the end. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel Black, who is my colleague, my co my co archivist here at the at the History Museum, and the other person who fields uh, all these questions with me. So, let's stop my screen. All right, Rachel, take it take it over. All right. Um, so, as Perry said, my name's Rachel, and I'm an archivist here at the Arizona Historical Society in Tucson. Um, and so we've got kind of a lot to cover. I think we're going to talk a bit about today the, his, the um, importance of property research um, and then just dive right into kind of like the process and some basic like how do you get started and what do you do when you're stuck. Um, so I think to start us out, um, I'll go ahead and I'm going to have my panel introduce themselves and if you could just, we're going to go by way of introduction, tell us who you are, um, your experience with property research. Um, do you do this for a job? Do you do this for fun? Um, and a little bit about like why you think this is important. So let's go ahead and start with, how about we start with Ricky? If you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh no. <laughs> So I got into property research as an undergrad. Um, I graduated from the University of Arizona with a history and Mexican American studies degree in May of 2020. And so the lead up to that um, was all of these research projects. So I had to do one for MAS and one for history. And I decided that I really wanted to research Tucson because um, I live here. I had a Mexican American studies degree and I really wanted to apply that. Um, so I picked a building downtown, which was Teatro Carmen. And I did research on that building and it ended up being a little bit more difficult <laughs> than I thought it was going to be. But um, so I do it for fun. I still do a little bit of property research. Um, I don't quite have the same amount of time that I used to, but I did learn a lot from that experience. Um, and it does help me out now because now I'm in the housing department. So I do small amounts of, of housing research on my own now. <laughs> um, so, but most of my research was in the archives. Um, and a little bit of local research right now. Great. Um, how about Damien? How about you next? Hi, I'm Damien Klinko, and um, I serve as the CEO of the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. Um, I also serve as advisor to the National Trust for Historic Preservation for the state of Arizona, and I serve on the ICOMOS 20th Century Heritage International Scientific Committee. Um, I have been involved in property research in a variety of ways related to historic preservation um, for about 15 years, um, and I've done a number of um, a variety of different projects that have um, sort of exposed different elements and different types of, of, of the resources available, including archiving, the architectural drawings that are housed at the um, uh, Tucson um, branch of the Arizona Historical Society. Um, so, you know, we've done a lot of different type of work. I get a lot of requests through the Preservation Foundation um, from people who are interested in finding out more about their property for a variety of different reasons. And um, I think that's something I could talk about because it's the first thing I always ask people when they call, what's, what is the purpose of the search? Because that really informs the direction that you take. Uh, so I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks so much for having me. All right, and last but not least, we have Dan Cowbell. Hello, uh, my name is Dan uh, Cowbell, as you said. I'm the uh, chief title officer for Fidelity National Title for Southern Arizona. So for Cochise County, Pima County, and Santa Cruz County, for our sister company, Lawyers Title, down there. And I started doing this 25 years ago. Uh, you start in what's called the customer service department or property research department. And you work your way up to becoming a, a title officer and then an underwriter. So what do I do? I basically make decisions and solve problems with 
with connection to, or in connection with rather, uh, real estate transactions, mostly commercial, but also residential. Um, I have people asking me, they'll, they'll say they have a property and they, you know, there's a plaque, a picture of people. Can you find out who used to own this? I'll say, yeah, there's about 120 deeds. I'll send it to you. You can see which one you think is it. But no, we, um, I searched the title. So I'm looking at public records, the assessor, the recorder, the treasurer, um, the courthouse. And uh, this is what I do for a living. And so I manage the market research department for Fidelity locally. And I look up stuff a lot, all day long, as a matter of fact, sometimes 13 hours a day. So that's what I do. And, and that's my story. I made it up. So I'm going to stick to it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so to kind of ease into this, um, we titled this event as virtually as a joke. Um, is my house historic or is it just old? Um, but that really is a question that Harry and I field a lot. And I mean, I live in an old house in Tucson from the 1930s and I don't consider it historic. So could you guys kind of speak to what really, what is the difference between what makes a house historic and what what's the difference between an old house and a historic house? Um, how about Damien, I feel like your organization tackles this a lot. So how about you start us off on this one? Yeah, so I think the first thing to remember is every, every property has a story. And I think that's really sort of the key fundamental starting place. Every property has a history in some way. The land has been here for a millennium, general, millions of years. The country has been here for, uh, you know, as the state since 1912. So there's a, there's a long history of the development and transfer of land. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Daniel will talk more about how you can dig back into the deep recesses of the origins of, of how land moves from government owned into a private property and then the subdivision property, the recurrence. In, in, our, in, in the US, historic really means, uh, is it listed on the National Register? or is it national register eligible? That's really what it's become to mean over time. Um, and and what, what that actually means is, is the property significant and does it retain sufficient integrity to convey that significance? So I'll just say that again. So the, is the property significant? So does something happen there or is it connected with something or, or a person or a place or a theme of history? And does it have sufficient integrity is the con to be able to convey that significance. So can you look at the property and have a sense of that historic period of time? So these things are measured, uh, um, the significance and integrity are measured, uh, are the measurement tools that you use to determine whether a property is really listed for, eligible for listing on the National Register. And when we talk about significance, that can mean connection to an event, connection to a person, connection to design or construction. And that can also mean community planning and development, or does it have the potential to convey future information? And it doesn't just have to be houses, it can be landscapes and bridges and irrigation ditches. It can be courthouses and it can be uh, uh, sidewalks. It can be a whole host of things, really anything that's been created by human beings at, to affect the the land, the built environment. And so, uh, so looking at those things as sort of a baseline is really, I think, what we're talking about today. Because when you start property research, what you're really doing is you're looking at the significance, you're looking at who built it, when did they build it, you know, and, and it's not just the person who commissioned it, it was it designed by an architect, who was the builder, was there a landscape architect, is it a vernacular style, is it rare, is it what's the architectural style, there's this whole host of things that you start to build out in a context which really begins to provide an understanding for that fundamental question you're asking, is it just old, or is it historic, and you know, buildings don't have to be, you know, we use this sort of benchmark in the US of 50 years old to be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, but it certainly doesn't have to be 50 because there are lots of newer properties that have achieved that significance uh, more recently because of their connection with things that have happened or people that are important. Thank you. Um, so Ricky or Dan, do either of you wanna add anything to that? 
Um, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> that definition of historic. Um, I also think about the community aspect of historic. Um, I think right now, especially as we look at things that are um, like in the National Register, there is discrepancy between things that are listed. You don't have a lot of like Mexican American houses listed on that. And so I think that's also like, does the community find this thing important? Because national registers are hard to get on. And I think about Teatro Carmen, that if you look at what it originally looked like, it would not make it on the, <laughs> the national register. It just has been changed so much, but the place that's there and the people who are still alive give it meaning. And so I think that's also an interpretation of like, what meaning does this house have? Is there, um, everything has a history, but is this history significant to a large number of people? Is it just historic for your family? Um, that type of thing. So I think like national registers are really good to go off of for have a lot of people looked at this and said, we think this is really important. We think this is a benchmark of history. Um, and then you can also say, well, maybe this has been lost. Like, have we had significant things that maybe we looked over and it is historic? We think it should be recognized, but not in a way that's, oh, this is 100% original because someone decided to plaster over the entire front of a building. <laughs> um, so I just I just tend to think a lot more about the community aspect of, of making history. And, and to, I think to Ricky's point too, you know, buildings, you know, the older and the rarer they are, the less the the issues around integrity are taken into consideration. So, you know, the, the properties that are the oldest in our community and that are the fewest theaters, you know, banks, you know, sacred spaces, they they don't necessarily have to look like they were on day one. And sometimes those changes also that have happened over time have significance in and of themselves. And so if a significant thing, you know, if a building was built in 1800 and a significant thing happened in 1930, or 1950 or 1960 or 1970. Um, but the building was changing over time. That, when that thing happened, may be the benchmark of, of what that building looked like. And so, you know, a good example would be the All Angels Church, which is known as the Tucson Performing Arts Center. Cesar Chavez held a rally there after his uh, fast at the Santa Rita site up in Phoenix. And the building looked different than it did when it was first built. But yet, the, 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 that significant moment in history is connected with how it looked when that rally occurred. And so we have to sort of take that into consideration as well. So it's nothing's black and white in preservation. It's very muddled. Right, and I think the question is, is if you're preserving something, what are you preserving? Are you preserving this building at this specific point in time or are you preserving this building over the life of the building itself. You know, if we have 200 year old buildings, people have used them for 200 years and we use them for different things. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think we'll move on to our next question. This will segue us into our next section. Um, what, why do you think it's important for people to research, not just these significant historic properties, but like, why is it important for someone to research even just the house they live in? What, what do we get out of this as people? I can answer that one. So I think a lot of times we don't realize the history that's there until we look into it. There's so much that slips under our radar. There are so many buildings in Tucson we can't look at all of them, but even if you as an owner, like you go and you research and you find, oh, something really important happened here, that's also important work in its own right that needs to be done that then you can shine light on other important aspects that um, I think on a like a city and a county level, we're so focused on these other big projects that happen that we we forget to look at the little things and it, it does have that real importance, like um, I guess. <laughs> I didn't know a lot about the Ethelfirm and I started researching it. And then I found out like, oh, there's other stuff that's going on with there that maybe I could I could lend a hand to or these people who come in and ask questions um, that somebody has to do it. Like that information deserves to be found <laughs> and at least captured in a way that other people would have access to it. And so I think that's also what's importance is, is uncovering what wouldn't otherwise be found. I, I would add, I think the I think that as we dig into the history of a place, it connects us back 
And we really start to value that in a different way. You know, when we, when we sort of drive past a house, you know, every day for 10 years, you sort of stop looking at it. But suddenly when somebody starts digging into the history and you connect it to incredible stories and personal experiences, and it creates this, this connectivity to the current moment, it makes the individual appreciate and value that asset in a different way than just going to a, a new development and buying something because it has this history. There is this sort of ethereal ephemeral nature to all of the things that have happened in a, in a property. And there's something I think about the human condition that really connects to it because we've been preserving buildings for thousands of years. So there's something about connecting to the past and connecting to sort of our roots and understanding our community that are so important in, in understanding and researching the properties that you know we live in. Um, all right, I think now we're going to shift into kind of the nuts and bolts of property research. So just a little bit of an overview. So I'm at the Arizona Historical Society, and um, if you've ever done any property research in Tucson, you probably come to visit us. Um, so there's, I think when we think about when I think about the materials that we have to research properties, there's kind of two different um, sections that I, or two different groups of documents and records that I think about. One is the unofficial documents, and one is the like official city, county, state official records that it has to be filed when you purchase land or purchase a house. Um, here at AHS, we have the things that kind of fall into the unofficial documents camps. We've got a lot of maps, um, photos, city directories. Um, we definitely don't have everything because unlike someone at like the assessor's office or um, who works with titles, we're not mandated to keep those records. Um, so we get what people give us. Um, so how about we do just another sort of round robin of um, like in your property research projects, what resources have you used the most, um, whether at AHS or other sources? Um, do you want me to jump in? I'll let whoever wants to take it. <laughs> So I'll, what I'll do is I'm actually just going to talk through sort of how I how I approach I approach something. So when I when I get a request or we're looking into a property, I, I think of it really as a funnel. So there's a lot of information out there, and so you start to sort of sort and sift the funnel. And so the first thing I do is sort of set up a Word document or a Google page, and I start sort of making just big sort of picture, you know, framework about the property, and start looking for this information. And and the first place that I always start is the Tucson map guide. So the city of Tucson and Pima County, they both have a really great GIS map. And I will put that map in the, I'll put the link to that um, in, the, uh, in the chat. Um, and, and really when you, when you get to that, you, you go down to the property level. And the first thing you do is you click on the assessor. I click on the assessor record and you click on the assessor, you go, through, go, you click, go down to the property level, you zoom into the property you're searching, you click on it, and then it gives you a lot of choices and you click on the, uh, the Pima County information, you get to the assessor's page. And on the assessor page, there's a place that says images. And in that images is a property record card. And that's a really key starting point uh, because you download that little document. And on that document, it gives you a host of information. It gives you an age, a relative age of the property. Um, those most of those cards were completed in the 1960s, and so uh, they were relying often on a discussion with the property owner on what the age of the house was. And on the piece of paper, it'll have on the right side, it does sort of all the way down to the sort of two thirds of the way down to the bottom. It'll have the date, and oftentimes that there's a date that's crossed out, and a new date has been added. And that new date, if you go to the the digital part and not to this piece of paper, um, that's the effective date. So because of taxation and the way that the valuation works, the, the assessor constantly updates the age based on permitted changes to the house. So if you put an addition on your house, they have a calculation and suddenly if the house was built in 1880, now it's listed as being built in 1890. So that gives you some really good information. It also tells you who the owner was in 1960. 
So if you are researching back and trying to find an original owner, it sort of gives you a jump start. And I'm sure Daniel will talk a little bit about how you do the property, like sort of uh, looking back through the, um, the reporters. But that's a really, really good place to start. The other thing that that map guide can give you is just a basic line of like, is the property located within a national register now, national register district? And if it's listed in the district, there's already been a lot of documentation done about the property. So it's really a good place to start because you can start to sort of demise the property into, has there been work done? Is it part of a historic district? Is it out of it? What was the age? Who was the original owner? And, and once you sort of start with that, I then jump to, uh, um, I then, you know, if it's all listed on the National Register, you can read the whole context. You can sort of, you, there, are, there are inventory, state inventory forms that you can track down through, through this map tool, which will have a photograph of the house and any relevant information that was identified during that survey work. Another really important thing to download at this point is the, the subdivision plat map, if it's in a subdivision. And that it will give you a lot of information about the early development history of where that house was built. So let's say it was built in Colonia Solana. You click on uh, you click on that, and it will tell you who the developer was and who actually designed the neighborhood layout and provide other information. So you can start to dig into the history of individuals who are connected uh, who are connected with the property. And the final place that I go, and then uh, um, we can talk more about even more details, is newspaper.com. It's a tremendous resource because you could do a word search in the Arizona Daily Star and the Tucson Citizen on the address of the house. And you just have to put in a whole host of variety of ways to search it because sometimes it's, you know, 21 East First Street. Well, is that 21 E1 ST or is it 21 East spelt out, first spelt out street? Or maybe you could put in the address of like the actual intersection that the house is at and you can find even older records. Uh, so it's really sort of, a, you have to be sort of really dig hard um, to find information, but there's often a, a tremendous amount of information. And then also, are you looking for really old history or are you looking for more recent history? Are you looking for, mid, because your house is in a mid-century modern subdivision or are you looking for something in Barrio Viejo that's uh, you know 160 years old? So those things really make very different track of how you're going to search moving forward. That's where I would start. So how about Ricky, you, when you came and did research here over the summer, um, you were doing a little bit of a different approach to your project um, and used some sort of different resources that we had here, less focused on like the history of a building and more about the people. Would you mind talking a little bit about sort of the things that you used in your research? Yes, so I can do that. Um, really, I also started with maps. I think initially I did look at those maps just to see like what is around, what is here um, as a wide focus. Because once you know where something's at and what it used to look like, you can kind of narrow down where to look. Um, from there, I started, I also looked at like assessors and things like that. So I knew who owned it. If I know, oh, the Elks owned this building, then I can start looking at Elks records rather than just trying to look at everything and hope I find something. Um, <clears throat> the issue I ran into, because it is a really old building, <laughs> is that there sometimes was not documentation. So I ended up having to go to sources that you wouldn't you usually think of using. Um, so like the microfish tapes, um, of what is that like newspapers that were in Spanish that was really difficult because I only have like a toddler understanding of Spanish so sorting through those and trying to find names and uses to the buildings um, and also recordings and don't I think really what's not as important is to not underestimate where you might find things <laughs> like don't root out certain sources um, where I ended up actually finding the picture the oldest picture of the building that that I think has been found so far was just in a random box of photos that were like labeled downtown. And I thought, why not? Like, what do I have to lose? I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything else on this building and I found it by accident. Um, so I wouldn't root out, like just say that I wouldn't not look at those sources, but um, maybe get a general understanding of what the building is before you start to look into those sources. So you're looking at them with a focus because um, the last thing you want to do is get sidetracked by everything else that's around your building and learn more about the building next door than the building you're trying to learn about. <laughs> um, and I think that's a pretty easy wormhole to go down, especially when you're looking in archives and you're pulling all of this information and 
as you're listening to people who tell stories about everything and get sidetracked kind of easily. <laughs> My turn. You're a little different than what we've been talking about. Yes, yes. I um my my ability is only to disclose what people have chosen to record in the public records. Um, so I can tell you who owned it at what time, and that's pretty much it. That's, that's really the extent of it. However, the process is similar to what Ricky was just saying. Um, always look for something where it shouldn't be, and then you're likely to find it there. Uh, that's my experience in 25 years of, of searching title, um, because we uh, what we do is we search a geographically posted title plant, and we also search the name, the grant or grantee. Um, one of the first places we go to is the assessor's record online, uh, the assessor's page. Uh, and when you enter the tax code of a property there, it will bring you to uh, a lot of information. When you scroll down to the bottom and click recording information, you're going to see the recording information for some deeds. Now, from there, good job, Ferguson, you put the, the website right in there. And uh, so when you get that information, you're gonna get a docket and page or a sequence number. You can then take that information and follow the rabbit trail. And the rabbit trail takes you to the Pima County Recorder's Office. And you go over to the Pima County Recorder's Office and you can, um, you can do a public search uh, there. There's a you scroll down and there's a lot of different ways to search it. Uh, you, you, you only have the ability to search the name, but there's different options. For example, the regular public search, you enter a last name and a first name, and you can get all the documents that have that name. Uh, and, but you can't see them unless you have a subscription to do so. But if you emailed our market research department at, uh, well, I'll put the email in there later, and say, hey, can I get a copy of this document? They'll email it back to you, and they won't even charge you anything. And um, so that's a, a resource available to researchers. Um, then uh, we also look at, we have old track notes. And I wanna, in a moment, I wanna show you guys, I wanna just share a screen to show you what those look like because they're similar to the ones you can find. Say if you chose a deed search or a deed book search at the recorder's office, you could put in the year, you could put in the first, letter of the person's first name and the first two letters of their last name. And you can download a TIFF file, which is a track book record. It's a, a written out grantor grantee search. Um, it's in cursive, you know, it's the old stuff. In fact, what I did before I got on here is I went ahead and I did one for uh, Drachman. I put in R and put DR and I put 1937. And I, I had two records pop up and I was able to see all the properties where Drachman, Roy Drachman was a grantee. Now I couldn't see those deeds. I could be putting information of those deeds and yeah, title company has a copy of them or the reporter's office. So what do you need if you want to research the ownership of land? Now the ownership of land doesn't tell you about the house that's built on that land. The house that's built on that land are the improvements. Uh, the land itself is what the uh, assessor, well, the assessors, recorders, treasurers, websites uh, in their archives will tell us. Um, as far as knowing what, you know, the, the, you can get lucky on the assessor sometimes. You can get into that PRC card area, the images area, and you can see an actual drawing of the plans for the home. But that doesn't always there. It's a hit and miss. Um, what we do is we'll keep following the rabbit chain backwards. But just because information isn't supposed to be able to be found at the recorder's office about a, when a property was built, it doesn't mean that you won't find that information there. And just because it should have some information there doesn't mean you'll find it there. So it can be kind of frustrating. Um, you will see that sometimes somebody will 
write up a little memorandum or whatever, an affidavit, and they want everybody to know when their house was built. They went out to the recorder's office and recorded. Well, that's one in a hundred people who would do something like that. Um, most people won't do something. I've never done that. Has anybody here in the room done that? Uh, I hereby want to tell the world when my house was built, just because I know you want to know a hundred years from now. Not typically, it doesn't happen. Um, so my records, my research are limited to ownership and tracing that back. I can tell you a lot, or it can tell you a little. You know, many times the, the records at the Pima County Recorder's Office and the Assessor's Office are in the 80s that you can actually view if you have a subscription. If you don't have a subscription, you'd actually have to go down there. And I believe you have to pay for copies. So what do you have to have in order to do a bunch of research on real property? You have to have an unlimited supply of money. So everybody's got that? Raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. No, it doesn't really that bad. I'm, I'm exaggerating and being redundant at times. And, um, but ultimately, um, if, if now's a good time, let me know and I'll do a screen share of what some of those records look like. Uh, is that okay? Yes, I made you a co-host so you can share your screen. Okay, very good. So I'm gonna hit this uh, screen share button and I'm going to see what it lets me do. Okay, there's the one I wanna share and share. So hopefully I'm sharing something now. Let me know if I'm not. Okay, so this is the assessor's website. I searched my property when I first uh, started got on here. Uh, there's where we live. Zip down to the bottom, recording information. There's my dockets and pages and the date they recorded. I can use that to go over to the reporter's website and I can uh, I can get information there. Um, I can do all kinds of searches there. It just takes the time to click on every little thing. Um, is everybody seeing my screen? Yep, we are. Oh, okay, very good. So one of the things I wanted to show you, I, I looked in my area out here in Rita Ranch, uh, section, uh, it's 15, Township 15 South, Range 15 East, Section 23. So I looked at our old track book map. So I'm opening that now to show you what it looked like back in the 70s. Look at that, there's nothing there except a railroad. And I realized something as I was looking at this, that railroad is really close to my house. So it's not there anymore. What happened? I can figure that out by doing research. Now, what does it look like today? Here is what it looks, this is an assessor's parcel map. Oh, sorry, wrong one. This one is an assessor's parcel map of what the section looks like today. Section 23, 15 South, 15 East. Here's Rita Road. Here's Houghton Road, a bunch of state land, and then my house is somewhere in there. But there's no railroad there. So how do we find out what happened to that railroad? Well, there's our title plant map. So I'm going to show you a sample of that. Um, let me rotate it the right way. It looks like we've got a note on this old map, this old title map. And what does it say? It says Southern Pacific Railroad. That's what that means. It says former railroad. And then it's got a docket and page. There was a deed to the USA and they wrote the docket and page in there, docket 648 at page 167. So now I can go to the reporter's office and ask for a copy of that and find out exactly when the railroad got rid of that railroad area. Uh, if I cared to find that information out. Uh, here is a sample of the old postings from the old track books. At the U of A library, they have some books just like this, I believe in the basement, because people have told me that they, um, they, they've seen them there before. I've never seen them, but these are our old track books. And when you zoom in, you see all these things are, uh, they're, they're written in cursive. Those are the grantor, the grantee, the document number, the date it was filed, uh, tells you which order section it's located in, it has little notes. You don't have access to these, we do, but I share them if you want me to. Now, here's a, a famous name right here, Sally Fletcher to Roy P. Drachman. He got an auction in 1951 for some land out in this area. So you can see all kinds of huge tool company, um, and there's that deed from Southern Pacific, the United States of America, recorded in 1953. 
So I can look at these things and it makes sense to me. Most people look at this and it takes a while to absorb it. Now, let's just look at a sample real quick of one from the recorder's office. Before we got on today, I went on the recorder's office. Like I said, I did R and DR for Drachman. I put in 1937 and I, I wanted a grantee index search. And this came up at the recorder's office free of charge. I was able to download it. Now I'm gonna zoom in, don't get dizzy. I'm gonna zoom all the way in here. And I've got uh, notes uh, on the side here. I've got, it says the subdivision or the range. Uh, it's got the surname, the given name, the grantors, the grantees. The one thing to know if you're going to try to research at the recorder's office, their indexes in their old deed book searches, they are not in recorded order. The, right here, if you see that, it says the date of the instrument. Why is that troublesome for a researcher? Because back in the day, a document could be dated April 1951 and never be recorded until April 1955. So the date of the instrument is helpful, but not when you're trying to search recorders office records because it, we're trying to find out uh, you know, when it was recorded, who owned it when. That date, however, can be important because you deliver a deed, you sign a deed, you deliver it, somebody holds it, it's delivered. With the recording acts, uh, it isn't really effective until it is recorded nowadays. Certainly the assessor is not going to change the name on the tax records until something records. So there's no evidence that you own it. Uh, somebody who records a document, that document takes priority over a document that isn't recorded, meaning you could have a deed to a property, somebody else got a deed from the same person and recorded it, you lose out. They own it, you don't, go to court and see who wins. They will probably win because their deed was recorded and those take priority. One of the things you can zoom in here and you can see these, this index tells me a book and a page. That's a docket and a page. Uh, dockets started somewhere in 1947 and went through till probably, I think it was 2011-ish, 2012. They use sequence numbers now. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay. Uh, we can talk about it later. You can follow up with me and, and we can explain more of what that means. D books went from the late 1890s up to the 1940s. Miscellaneous records were in there somewhere. There's so much to teach and so much to know that there's no way I can cover it all tonight. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point and kick it back over to you guys because I think I've said what I can say on the topic. No, thank you for that. So um, as I noted in the beginning here at the Historical Society, we have a lot of the unofficial records and we actually have, we do have some deed and title records that were extracted from the recorder and the assessor's office at various points in times, but ours are kind of spotty, <laughs> some of them. And so it's nice to learn where the rest of these things are and how to get to them. Um, so I think that Rachel, you, your audio. Oh, Muted, thanks. Um, so before we open it up to our questions, which just want to remind people that you can, if you do have questions, um, specific questions about this process and not necessarily a specific question about your personal property, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we can, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, but so I think that a big question that we get is what, so you say you've done all this historic research and your home or your building you're interested in is you think it is historic and is significant. Um, what, what's the next step for that? Like, what do you do with that information? Um, I know that there's different levels of national or historic listings. Um, just what do you, what would you all in your professional or non-professional capacity recommend people do once they've done all of this, this research? 
Um, I guess we'll let Damien start this one. So, but before before I talk about that's and that's a great question, and I think there are some real options. But before I talk about that, I just want to really touch base on why the names matter. Why does the chain of history matter? So you know. Knowing who owns a property is one thing. Knowing who lived in that property is a whole nother thing. So one of the ways that you can build, so there's sort of, you can have these dual tracks to sort of really get back in time. So you can have a list of all the owners, but you can also have a list of everyone who lived there. And you get that by going to the city directories, which are at the Arizona Historical Society or the main library downtown. And you can go through year by year and you can see who lived in a property. And it really gives you a real clean snapshot. Also, you'll see when the property first appears in the city directory. So if you sort of say, oh, my house was built in the 50s and you go to like 1950 and your house isn't there and you go to 1955 and the house is there, then you go to 1954 and it's not there. Well, your house was probably built in 1954. They moved in and that, you know, 1955 is the first year. And so you can start to piece together some things that way. Another question we get all the time is who designed my house? Like who was the architect? Who was the, who was the builder? In, there are a couple places to go for that information too. The city of Tucson at Development Services, they have microfilm in their archives, uh, which if that building, if the house or building was built in the city of Tucson limits, um, they may have a copy of the of the of the blueprints that were uh, were were filed uh, with development services. So you can find all sorts of things. There are blueprints that go back like of Hotel Congress because that was in the city of limits. But if it was in the county, those records may not exist in the same way on that microfilm. So it's, it's sort of a hit or miss, um, but those are other really important resources. Uh, also the Scavani collection, which is a photographic collection, which was a real estate uh, le like lending, which is great photographs of a lot of houses, houses in the city. Um, but when you when you decide what to do with all this information, I, I when I, we we do this, we usually turn it into something. So you know, we tend to do deep levels of, of research and a deep dive because we're working on a national register nomination for an individual property, or we're working to list it as a local landmark. And these are two different tools that are highly valuable uh, for uh, designating and celebrating your property. And, and they these tools are designed for anybody to do it. They're, it's complicated, it's time consuming, but it's worth it. Um, if you get listed on the National Register as, an, as a National Register listed property, or you could be listed individually, or you could be listed in a district, um, it, you have to have a high level of significance to, to, to meet the bar, and it does take a lot of work, but you get 50% off, about 45 to 50% off your property taxes for 30 years if, you're, if you can get listed on the National Register. I think the more valuable tool really is a pe people who are doing this level of research because they really care and they really see themselves as stewards of their home. Uh, you can apply uh, for a designation uh, as a local city landmark. And it's a, this is a tool that will actually protect your house into the future and make sure that changes re require a review. And it, it's really the, the only tool we have to really protect uh, properties in the city of Tucson. And that significance can be everything, you know, I, I was, you know, it could be everything from a, a market in Barrio Anita to, you know, big mansions in the Catalina foothills. It can be the whole host of a variety of things because it's really about celebrating the, the, the richness of diversity in our, in our community. Um, Ricky or Dan, do either of you have anything to add? Yeah, well, I had something about what Damien was originally talking about in the beginning um, about those directories. I guess it's like an asterisk. They're really helpful, um, but they're also released based off of previous year's information. Like they spend the whole year collecting it and then they publish it the next year. And especially if you're researching downtown, people moved like every single year. And in certain periods of time, people took their addresses with them, which is why the maps are really important because the post office didn't care <laughs> where you put your address, they just let you carry it around with you. Um, so I think that's also being where if you're gonna like start finding out who lived in the house and try to research that person that sometimes those dates are a year off. Like when you're reading the directory, they're actually looking at the year before. Um, but. Damien is the one who would know all about the the landmarking. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> you know, another another great resource is Special Collections at the University of Arizona. Um, the they also hold the Arizona Architectural Archives, and unfortunately, they have not been fully archived. There are finding aids, um, but the almost the entire body of work of Jostad, 
who was a significant architect who designed many of the homes in West University and Armory Park. Uh, his entire collection is housed uh, in special collections. Josias Jostler, another very celebrated noted architect locally, all of his architectural plans are there, uh, as well as a host of sort of uh, architects who aren't recognized in the same way. Um, Roy Place's uh, drawings, uh, uh, Merritt Starkweather's drawings are at the Arizona Historical Society. Roy Place's uh, drawings are at special collections, although there are some plans that are, that are at special collections. But lots and lots of houses from that sort of early, you know, late 1800s to 1930s, they do exist. They are, they are have the, if, there is a, if there's a finding aid that you can get your hands on, they're listed by the name of the person who commissioned the house. So knowing who that first owner is, is really, uh, is a really an important factor in finding out. And you know, and it's, it's just about getting lucky. You know, when you stand in front of your house and you say, oh, does this look like it's architect designed or is this a 1950s house? Is it designed by Robert Lusk and the Lusk Corporation in 1962 or is it, nor arts or crafts bungalow, or is it an adobe house that's just vernacular and that isn't going to have an architect? Sort of taking that first look and understanding just on a baseline what, what you're looking for is so important um, because the, you know each and every one of those ways you search in a different way, although there's lots of overlap. I don't know if this is exactly to the point you guys are talking about, but you're talking about the builder, you're talking about who built it. One of the things that happens that is unique to Pima County, Santa Cruz, Cochise, and I think Navajo County, perhaps Canal as well, uh, and it only happens in these counties, when a subdivider uh, wants to take a piece of land and take a pizza cutter and just split that sucker up and uh, make it into a bunch of little pieces from a big piece, what they have to go through is called a process called a third party subdivision trust. It's an assurance for the completion of subdivision improvements. And what are those? Those are what we call off sites. And what does off site mean? Off site means not in the lot where the house is built, meaning the roads, the infrastructure, the sewer system, electric utilities, and all that. So there was historically some times where builders would start and not finish what they started. Not only that, but they were hiding behind these trusts. And so in the 70s, there was a law, ARS 33404, which means that if you have your property in any trust, you also have to disclose the name and the address of the beneficiary of that trust. So what you will see reported many times are these deeds from a developer company to a title company under its trust number X, 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 whatever. Trust number 10,422, trust number 722. When you see that, if you, you can go backwards from those records and you can track it to find out who sold it to the developer and you can figure out on the basis of when each lot was sold, uh, you can look at that deed where the trust came on the title and you can see who the beneficiary was. You can see the name and the address of that beneficiary and usually it's a, uh, Pulte Homes, uh, U.S. Homes, or whatever, whoever home builder uh, that did that. And that's unique to our county because like if in Phoenix, if you were to do a project, you just do a bond uh, and the people have to deal with a bonding company. But what, the, what our process does down here is it keeps it so that a developer has to finish the infrastructure. There has to be an inspection to make sure all of the item, you know, all the offsite items are in. And uh, the title company is bound by that agreement. The developer signs it, the municipality signs it, whether it be Sorita or a Valley, City of Tucson, Pima County, and the developer signs it. So the title company is bound to not sign a deed until the municipality says it's okay to sign that deed. And so because of that process, you find the deeds that go in and out of the trusts and you go backwards from there to find out who who developed the land perhaps, did the entitlement, and then who actually sold the property to an individual home buyer. And that's usually a clue as to who actually built it. So that's just another bit of my uh, rant now. So I'm happy to show, just do a quick sort of how you can use the, I'm also how you can use the city of Tucson map guide. I'm happy to share my screen and, and show how you sort of quickly move through that if that's helpful. Um, 
So if you go, so, so this is what the map guide looks like. And um, can everyone, I assume everyone can see that. So this is, I just zoomed into Fort Lowell. So this is a really old part of Tucson. It's complicated. It was federal land that was turned into a military site. Then it was auctioned off. There were different parcels. There was lots of subdivision. It's, it is a, con there was, you know, issues with where staking was done. But if you look at the aerial, you can see, uh, you can see the, uh, this is sort of, this is to give you a little, this is Craycroft. Fort Lowell Park is here. And I'm gonna just click on this house. It's the Post Trader store. It's one of sort of the iconic houses of, of Fort Lowell. So you click here and this tells you who the owner is. It gives you a little bit of property research information. You can click here on where it says property research. It really gives you like a direct line of to where you're going. So when I was talking earlier about finding the property record card, you click on the assessor record card here. And this takes you to this really nice overview. It tells you sort of just general information, how big the property is. It also shows you historical permits. Uh, and, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Pima County Assessor Search up here. So you just copy this number. You used to be able to click directly, but somewhere along the way, you now have to copy and paste. Uh, we will open this and we come back to the same record that Daniel had pulled up earlier that shows all that different information. I always go to images. And in images, there's sometimes a picture of the house. And then there's the assessor record map information. But then this is what I find particularly useful as a first, as a first stop, which is the property record card, the PDF image. And so these were created again in the 1960s. They're more complicated the older the property gets. And this one, when we scroll down, it has all sorts of information. So this is this is sort of the guest house, and it tells you it was built in 1939. And it tells you what it's built out of. It gives you all sorts of information. But here's the main house. Um, and if we zoom in, so it tells you like one, that it's, well, it says the foundation is concrete. The exterior, exterior walls are mud adobe. So it's pretty accurate. It shows a footprint of the house. But then here, it's giving you both the effective age and the original age, 1870, the modifications that were made in 1936, and then changes that were again made in 1976. And when they average that out, they give this effective date. But this record generally has the original, close to the original date of the house. And this is a really good sort of benchmark. Um, normally, it'll appear here, the original date. And then that'll often be crossed out. And the effective date appears uh, appears over here. Sort of what we do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing, and then I'm going to reshare. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of how you can collate all of this information together. Um, this is a uh, City of Tucson Historic Landmark nomination that we are working on. Um, this is for the Jostler, uh, Jostler designed house that he designed for himself. There was a question in the chat, did Jostler always work with, um, with Murphy? And the answer was no, he did a lot of independent projects. Uh, he was, did a lot of work for, uh, for Murphy. He actually was an employee of Murphy and then did a lot of uh, consultation projects. So this house is in Poets Corner. And so you know, this, we have a great photograph, but we, we always sort of provide a context. So you just start to describe the property. Uh, we were able to find historic photos uh, through the University of Arizona uh, College of Landscape Architecture that show the house being built. Um, we dug further and we were able to find uh, additional photographs of the house when it was when it was first built. We went to the Arizona Historical Society and ordered a photo from the Scavaney collection without going in. It turned out to just be a lot of trees, so it wasn't super helpful. We found in the Bill Sears collection, uh, the house had been photographed in 1958 by the second owner, which also provided more context and understanding of how it developed. Um, it showed a lot of the original details, some of which are there and some of which have been lost. There was an addition that was added and through searching on newspaper.com, it turned out to be designed by, um, by Veronica Hugart, who lived in the Fort Lowell neighborhood and was an architectural designer who really deserves a lot more research. She's a, an amazing female architectural designer, woman architectural designer, who has not gotten a lot of recognition, but did some of the last and best revival architectural work uh, in the 20th century in Tucson. Um, and, you know, we were able to find more, again, more information of the, about the landscape and the changes to how the landscape occurred. Um, this is the photo we were able to find at the Arizona Historical Society. So if we had just stopped with the Historical Society photo, it didn't tell us a lot about the house, but we were able to see in the in this sequence of photos 
the, the development of the landscape. So you can see the early plantings and then how they grew up over time. And this is a short period of time. This was 1938 when the trees were planted and this was 1942 when this photo was taken. So you can sort of see how the transformation of the landscape uh, is occurring. We also were able to find a photo of old photograph slides of the, uh, of the original paintings that were on the walls, which also gave sort of insight into who was doing that and who was vol involved in the project. We put together an ownership history, which is, was great. So this property ended up being owned by the University of Arizona for a while, but it was originally 1933, the Jostlers purchased it. They didn't build the house till 1936. Um, the, uh, 1936 to 1939, they, they lived there, then they rented it, then they sold it. Then it was sold to the University of Arizona, actually it was given, and then it had a sequence of additional owners to today. And so this starts to really frame out sort of who was there. Then I didn't know anything about Colonial Estates, the subdivision that it was located in. So we dug into that and we were able to find out all about who, uh, who actually did the subdivision. Why was it subdivided that way? What was, the, what was the context for understanding that? And all of that adds to, up together to sort of give a much richer understanding of the importance of a, importance of a property. As part of this, we also, I think I, we, we have a good idea that the house next across the street also was designed by Jossler, which has not been, uh, not been attributed to him uh, before. This was his first house. And then I'll just scan down. These are some of other architectural drawings from the U of A School of Architecture that show some of his architectural development. And so this is other houses in the community that show how this house fits into a, into a canon of work and a context. So I just wanted to share that because this is sort of how you can begin to collate and bring all of your information together sort of into something that really has meaningful value. And, and again, you know, this, we started and we said, well, what's there? You know, we just, we literally started with the address and then we built this out of that, um, just digging and digging and digging and digging and calling and making calls and looking and trying all the different archives and all the different resources and continuing to search and looking through the deed records and putting the whole sort of story together. And, uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, you have something that's really significant and that's worthy, uh, really worthy of preservation and protection in our city. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really good example of what we experience too. You know, when we start to look, we like when you when you asked for that one photo and we looked it up and it was just a photo of bushes and we said, oh, this isn't very helpful, but um, you know, you were able to build on it just by just by digging. And that was just, you know, the one thing that we had here at, at our place, like at, at the historical society and you were able to keep building on it from there, so. It, unfortunately, a lot of times, like when people come to us and they and they have property research they want to do, we say, okay, like buckle up, because you know sometimes if it's a really well known house or you know really well documented house, you get lucky, but it's rare. But I would say it's it's more rare to do that than uh, than to have to do all this kinds of digging. But it's yeah, you know, as you've shown, it's very it can be very fruitful. Um, but yes, it does take quite a lot of work. Um, I just wanted to point out really quick, so we actually have two, uh, two of our attendees uh, who have been listening in are actually also have some, some really important uh, records that we've touched on a little bit. We have uh, Joe Ferguson from the assessor's office is here, uh, and also Elizabeth Wheeler from the U of A, who works with a lot of those collections. So I asked, I asked Elizabeth if she wouldn't mind popping in for us second and saying something, you know, what, what they have over at the U of A that, that can be really helpful. Okay. Hi. So um, my name is Elizabeth Wheeler. I'm a graduate assistant at the University of Arizona Libraries in Special Collections. Um, I'm actually graduating in a week, so pretty soon I'll be able to call myself an official archivist, um, getting my master's in library science. So in special collections, we have a lot of different types of collections, particularly of interest. I put a link in, in the chat um, for this sort of work would be um, the digital collections that we have for um, Archives Tucson. And then also the Jack Schaefer Photographic Collection has a lot of, um, collect a lot of photographs of houses and neighborhoods um, 
Like um, Damien mentioned, um, unfortunately, the architecture collections have not been processed and have not been digitized. Interestingly enough, I actually was cleaning them last week. So they're still in use. And if you'd like to see them, all you have to do is send an email to um, the reference request uh, on the website. Let them know the house that you're looking for, the neighborhood, the area, and um, any of the student workers or the researchers there would be happy to sort of dig through the collections. Um, another thing you can do is you can search um, the Arizona Archives online, um, which is where all of the finding aids for special collections, um, not just the U Arizona, but also um, ASU's collections, NAU's collections, a lot of the different collections here in the state, all of their finding aids are centrally located here, and you can search by keyword, you can search by address, by name, and sort of dig through. And if you find something that you think might be interesting, you can then reach out to that researcher, they can pull those files for you, let you know what's in there. And then when everything starts to open up as the pandemic continues to move on, you can go in and see those in person and get photographs and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's always good to hear from like an insider perspective. Uh, of, of how to you know dig into those records. And so I know that we have been, um, we've all been blasting out a lot of links. So for all of you watching, don't worry, we'll, we'll compile all of them and, and, and send them out uh, when we send out that follow-up email. Um, and then I know we've touched a lot on, on the assessor's uh, office, but I do have the contact as well for, for Joe Ferguson over there. And uh, I'll be, we'll keep talking. And, and if anybody has any specific questions about navigating the assessor's office. We've touched on a lot of them and he's been chiming in on the chat. Um, so let me just see if we have any questions that we haven't covered. I know we've been, this has been like rapid fire, lots of information, but it's it's like necessary, right? That's why we ended up making this a, a little bit of a longer event because we knew we were gonna have so many different things to cover. Um, and one of the questions that has that I saw coming up in the chat was about some other areas of the state. So I just want to mention that we I know we focused on Tucson for this one, but we will actually we're going to be doing our archivists in Tempe are going to be doing a uh, program later on in the year that focuses on Maricopa and, and central Arizona uh, so that we can kind of share those resources as well. And I know that that Pima County has some of its uh, it's got its quirks or like its unique things that that come with uh, with searching the records. But a lot of what Dan has covered is is more universal, you know, with title pools and things like that. A lot of the the sources. Uh, oh yeah, so Joe put his email in the in the chat, so we'll we'll also send that out as well if you need some help uh, compiling or navigating the assessor site. Let me see if we have any other questions we haven't really covered. There was a question that actually, I don't know the answer to if there's a, someone asked if, if there is still a program where buildings can get plaques that indicate their historical significance. And I don't know that, do any of you know? So the black plaques that say listed on the National Register of Historic Places, you can order those yourself. There was never a program that to provide them to you. There was a um, for um, sort of very sort of uh, individually listed significant places like the San Pedro Chapel or Hotel Congress. The um, Historical Commission produced bronze plaques as part of a statewide program. Um, uh, but that program, I don't think, has been producing plaques for quite a long time. Uh, but the individual plaques, you can just go online and order. There's a number of companies that do it. One's called, um, I think, Franklin uh, Bronze. But you can go on. You can give them what you want. They'll give you a price, and, uh, and you can order one. Um, yeah. So this, this question might be for you as well. Um, cause I do not have any clue about this one, but someone asked if anyone knows who is working on loosening the restrictions of Prop 207, I guess 2006, that made establishing historic districts difficult. Yeah, I tried to start answering that in the chat. So, oh. so national register districts, there actually has been no slowdown of national register districts. Um, they, they are not perceived as impacting property values. It's actually, it's incentive based and it doesn't, being listed on the national register does not protect a property. If you're listed on the national register, you can still get a demo limit, demolition permit and the property can still be torn down. Um, being listed as an inside of a local preservation zone is a protective over local 
full zoning tool. It's an overlay and it, by law, the property then becomes protected and requires a review. You can still make changes, you just have to go through a process. The same thing with the local landmark designation. Um, it has it has certainly slowed down the creation of local landmarks, but you know, but not real and or local preservation zones. We only have five preservation zones in the city of Tucson: Armory Park, Barrio Viejo, El Presidio, West University, and Fort Lowell. And those were all created over 30 years ago. So there was not a rush, and then all of a sudden 207 happened, and then they stopped. We had just haven't done them in a long, long time. The city of Tucson has initiated two new HPZs. Uh, one is a, is a major expansion of the West University neighborhood to include the Feldman's uh, area, and the other is looking at Harold Bell Wright Estates. So there, and, and I know there's at least two or three other neighborhoods across the city that are now looking at using this tool, um, and we'll see what happens. Hmm. I did not know any of that, so good to know. Let's see, let's see. Um, I had something about using archive searches. I don't know if that's oh, yeah. Cool. Um, the U of A does have a new library webpage. It's not very good at searching things. <laughs> um, so I know that was one of the things that I had to learn a lot, but I also do a lot of archive work. Let me share my screen. Is it going to let me share my screen? <laughs> Hold on. Let me make you a host really quick. Okay. okay. You should be able to now. Okay. Let's do this. Um, so if you go to the main library page, like for the Arizona of University, the University of Arizona, goodness, um, and you wanted to look at things that are in special collections or just things that they have on file, um, don't ever use this main library search because it doesn't actually accurately search things for you, but go to the advanced search and then you'd be able to actually put in um, like a, a better definition of what it is that you want to look for. Uh, if you put things in parentheses, it'll look for those that exact term. Um, so if we do like Barrio Viejo, and I'll just put, I'll just do that. Um, it'll put up, pull up a list of resources with that, like exactly what I had in parentheses. But if you do click, this one is available online, but it'll also tag other subjects for you. So you can help find things that maybe will fit in with what you're looking at for that you wouldn't have looked at um, usually. If it is something that is available on, a shelf like you could go in and look at it like this one tells you it's that special collections it'll usually tell you what is next to it on the shelf um, because things are shelved with like things um, so maybe you're looking at barrio viejo but then there's also you could look at adobe houses which are in barrio viejo um, armory park other things that are in the area that that might interest you that are those things where you think oh i wouldn't find something there that relates but actually does relate um, I found a lot of things that way just by looking at other things close by, um, information about neighborhoods, information about people, about the building itself that I wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, so I think being able to use, especially because Special Collections is not open all the time, they do have limited hours, um, you can't bring in pens, <laughs> uh, things like that, that if you go into Special Collections and you already know what it is that you're looking for, it makes it a lot easier to use your time wisely um, versus getting there and then trying to find out what it is that you're looking for. Um, that's just my advice there. No, oh, thank you for touching on that. Cause even, I mean, even those of us who do this for a living struggle, like, I mean, it's, it can be hard to do these searches. And so it's always like, um, I mean, I know that especially in archives, it can be very jargony and, and you can, and it can be kind of hard to start that research. But I think the important thing here is to remember that, I mean, we brought, we brought these, this group of people together because we're all dedicated to doing this kind of research. And so we are all, all here. I mean, I know we, I make jokes about how we pawn people off on, on Damien or like we send them to the historic, the preservation foundation or things like that. When we, when we don't, we know we don't have something in our archives, but really it's, it's about us all working together to help, you know, answer these kinds of questions. Cause we're working on these kinds of questions ourselves. Uh, and one thing that Rachel and I were discussing earlier is that we, in the archives, we learn just as much from the researchers who come in as they learn from us. Uh, so if you come in and uh, we have, for example, we have all sorts of photos of houses, but we don't know what street they're on. For example, they're unidentified houses and we have maybe the street number 
or just the generic street, but we don't have any information about where that house is. So, uh, you know, it, we really we depend on researchers as well to help fill in those gaps for us and to and then we can incorporate it in, in our collections, what we have in the archives and, and share that with the next person who comes along. So we're all working together to answer these questions uh, and fill in these gaps. Um, so, you know, I really, I'm gonna, let me do a really quick check and see if anybody else had a question that we didn't touch. I, I do, I, I, know. I have a question. <laughs> Yeah. Does anybody know if there is a source where all of the subdivision CCNRs are located? Um, you know, all of the subdivisions created these CCNRs and they are just scattered in, in the recorder's office, but they don't seem to be collated anywhere. Can I show you something really quick? And that's, yeah. uh, uh, actually I can't show it to you because I'm not connected to that particular system. But uh, the only place that I know of where CCNRs are collected in one place are the title companies. And what I did, I paid one of my employees 500 bucks to scan all of the CCNRs into fo separate folders by the book and page of the subject. So I have a server that I can go to. And I can just scroll up and down. I can go into that folder and all the CCNRs are there. Now, is it guaranteed? No. So there's one way, however, for you to say, Dan, subdivision, it's, um, let's see, what was one of the famous ones everybody always asked about? Uh, uh, Rancho Sin Vacas, ranch with no, no cows. Um, can I get the CCNRs for that one? There's an email you can email. It's called TucsonMR at FNF.com. I put it in the side chat there. And we provide CCNRs for no charge to the general public um, for people who want that kind. Um, however, there is no place where the CC, you know, the, the homeowner association for each separate one probably has a copy. Um, the, they might not, <laughs> but, but ultimately those, that's the information that we put when you go to buy or sell a home, what comes out is not called a preliminary title report, though everybody calls it that. So it's a label, but it's a commitment for title insurance. It has what's called schedule B or exceptions from coverage, meaning we know about it, you know about it, we showed you. So if you paint your house pink and there was a restriction that said you couldn't do that, we're not gonna pay to have you paint it back again. Um, but if there is that there and we didn't show it, now we have to cut a check. But those things would be on a condition of a title report or a, con a commitment for title insurance, some form of title. But you can also do your best to find that subdivision plat, you can go, when you get that plat, I'm gonna close my eyes because I see things better when I'm not looking at them, if that makes sense. The upper left-hand corner of that plat usually, or on the other side, in the middle of the page, is what is called the dedication. And in the dedication, they will cite the recording information for the first set of CCNRs. It'll be a document page. Now what you can do is you can go to the recorder's website and you can go to the public search you can go down, scroll all the way down to where it says docket and page and enter that there, wait for it to populate. And then you have to click on the docket. It won't show you what you want unless you click on it. Then it populates this little thing showing all of the amendments to that docket. So it shows cross references. Everything that was properly cross referenced will be able to be seen there. Now you either have a subscription with the recorder, they, they charge a buck a page, and that's going to get expensive at 99 page CCNRs. But um, what you can do is you can get what that recording information is from the recorder site. And they can shoot an email over to Tucson MR, say, hey, can I get a copy of this? For us, it's as easy as typing it in, hitting view, dragging the PDF out of the email, and hitting send. It's like that fast. So, but there is no place where they're all together uh, other than title companies. You know, I would love to work with you, Dan, to maybe figure out how we could get like everything from, you know, till World War II, you know, just the, the original ones, not the amendments, just printed out because uh, they, I think it really provides a glimpse into some of the building practices of the city. And I know there are, I, we get this question all the time and I just don't know how to, or to advise people. Um, so maybe we can work together to come up with a, a way to make it more publicly accessible, at least a copy at the, at the Historical Society. 
awesome. Absolutely. It's an email I, away. I, yeah, and I, you know, I knew that. One more time, sorry. Oh, um, well, I can send you my email um, for direct stuff, but uh, Tucson MR, so it stands for Tucson Market Research, uh, Tucson MR at fnf.com. It's Frank, Nancy Frank. Dot com. So the Tucson MR at FNF.com and sent it again there. Unless I didn't. I don't think I did. I hit the button wrong. So, um, but yeah, that's our market research department. If it meet me and Melissa, my my uh, my Jedi apprentice, she uh, I'm training her in the ways of the force. And um, both of us watch that box. I knew this was gonna be helpful for all all of us, not just that we're like sitting here like blabbing at people, you know, about what we know. I knew that it would also help us all be in, in communication with each other. So that's great. And, you know, you made me think of one other thing where we were talking about kind of hidden, um, hidden resources. And I, I touched on this a little bit, but a lot of the neighborhoods have neighborhood associations and people know a lot. I mean, and I, yeah, Ricky's like nodding because I'm sure you you ended up talking to a lot of people too. Uh, because a lot of times I will I will refer people to uh, the neighborhood association, especially the more active ones, just because uh, there are the chances are high that if you're starting to research your neighborhood, somebody's already started and somebody's done that before in the past. I mean, uh, Tucson is a very uh, historic preservation kind of town. Uh, we care a lot, a lot about that, about it here. Um, and so, I, yeah, just always try to look up people around you who, community members who, who might know these things as well, because fountains of knowledge. <laughs> okay, so I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, y'all, but I think we've covered a whole lot of ground tonight. We are down to the last few minutes. Uh, and I, I, you know, we had a ton of questions in the chat, but we really ended up covering most of them. Uh, and if there's anything that we didn't cover, just remind everyone that you can always email uh, us here at the AHS archives, our email, I'll send our email out uh, again, but it is AHS reference at azhs.gov. And that's our archivist team. Uh, you'll, you'll reach both of us in, uh, in Tempe and in Tucson. And we always try to keep in contact with these guys as well. So, so we can all be in touch and, and direct you where you need, need to go. So thank, thank you again to our, to our panelists tonight. Uh, you Speaking of fountains of knowledge, you are them, and we really appreciate uh, you speaking with us tonight. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Keep an eye out for an email follow-up. Thank you all. <laughs>